Good day. In my program yesterday, I talked about the reports that were starting to trickle out of Russia that um, on the eve of President Putin's announced ceasefire, there appeared to have been significant Russian advances around Bakhmut and in particular in the north, in, 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 a, in the town north of Bakhmut, practically a um, suburb of Bakhmut, but it's an independent uh, locality, uh, the town of Solidar. Well, we've had a cascade of news coming out of the battlefronts in Ukraine over the last um, couple of hours. I should say that the um, truce, the Christmas truce that President Putin unilaterally announced is still in effect. It's still got a few hours to run, but it does seem as if it has made little difference to the overall military picture, which I think is what most people who've been following this war carefully expected. And in addition, over and above the fact that the truce doesn't seem to have worked, at least not to any extent, we're also getting a huge cascade of news about a collapse of Ukrainian defences in Solidar. Now, briefly, on the topic of the truce, there's been some sardonic comments in the West about how the Russians supposedly themselves ignored this truce, how Russian forces continue to take the offensive, to advance in various places, continue shelling, that kind of thing. I have to say that given that the Ukrainians and the Western powers all categorically rejected the truce, I find these comments somewhat odd. I don't really understand why the Russians should be criticised for abiding by a truce which the other side has rejected. But anyway, I just mentioned this. I think the truce idea was not perhaps in military terms. It didn't make much logical military sense. I said yesterday that I thought that the military would probably uh, receive it through gritted teeth. Um, shortly after I did that program, I saw a, um, an, a, a long message from Dmitry Medvedev, the deputy chair of Russia's Security Council, the person who's now been appointed the vice chair of uh, Russia's military industrial commission. Medvedev said that the military people received, would have received, the news that Ukraine was rejecting the truce with a sigh of relief, or at least with words to that effect. So I've never thought that that made a great deal of sense militarily. There's been another piece that I, by the way, read uh, on Slavyangrad from a Russian commentator pointing out that the Russian army in its Tsarist times, when Russian Orthodoxy was the official religion of the Russian Empire, which, by the way, it is not today. Um, in those days, the Russian army did not impose upon itself truces to coincide with religious holidays. And what Putin has done, or his announcement of a truce, and the patriarchs call for a truce, is to some extent a Western innovation. Anyway, putting all that aside, I'm not going to discuss the truce further. It doesn't seem to have made any significant or real difference. But in terms of the battlefronts, the information from Solidar, dribbling out of Solidar, does seem to be uh, different and important. It seems that the Russian forces, led by the fighters of the Wagner organization, have now captured at least half of Solidar. They're consolidating their positions in the center of this town. They're pushing Ukrainian forces towards the northwestern suburbs of Solidar. And there are claims, which of course I am not able to corroborate, but there are claims from various Russian officials, including from one of the Lugansk People's Republic, that Solidar will be fully under Russian control within the next few days. And there's also more reports of Russian advances happening 
all across the Bakhmut battlefields. And I would say that the loss of Solidar, which some commentators are claiming is in military terms even more important in holding together the so-called Zelensky line, the line that, of defense running from Bakhmut all the way up to Sivask, that um, the loss of Solidar is going to put Ukrainian defenses in the northwest suburbs of um, Bakhmut itself, I would have thought under impossible pressure. And with the Russians already advancing, apparently in places like Obitnoye, Kleshcheyevka, and eventually Iv Ivanovka, and already fighting in some of the sub suburbs, the residential areas of Bakhmut itself, it does seem as if the fall of Solidar is going to assist the overall Russian drive towards capturing Bakhmut. In fact, I've even seen one report claim that once Solidar is um, fully under Russian control, which this particular report expects will take around two or three days, then Ukrainian positions in Bakhmut will probably start to collapse within a period of around two weeks, and that it's highly likely, according to this commentator, that the Ukrainians will put, try, instead of holding on to Bakhmut, they will try to pull their troops out from Bakhmut. Now, there have been many reports over the course of the Battle of Bakhmut that um, the Ukrainians were pulling out of Bakhmut, and in every case, those reports turned out to be untrue. The people, the reporters who claimed that, were confusing the pullback of Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut with a rotation of Ukrainian units that were defending Bakhmut. So what was actually happening is that when a unit that was defending Bakhmut, uh, a brigade or whatever, suffered sev severe losses, it would then be withdrawn and replaced with a fresher unit to allow the battle in Bakhmut to continue. So that was what was the pattern previously. But perhaps if the fall of Solidar does take place within the next few days, and if the fall of Solidar is as consequential as people say, which, by the way, I think it is, then maybe, just maybe, those voices within the Ukrainian military leadership who have been apparently calling for a withdrawal from Bakhmut for some time, maybe those voices will finally prevail and perhaps we will see a Ukrainian retreat from Bakhmut allowing the town to fall fully under Russian control. And just to repeat again, contrary to much Western commentary, contrary to much Ukrainian commentary, the Battle of Bakhmut is consequential. If Bakhmut does fall, it does sit astride the main transport hubs used by the Ukrainian forces in their defense of uh, Donbass and defense of the Ukrainian-controlled areas of Donbass, in, especially in Donetsk region. I would have thought that, for example, um, Ukrainian positions in a place like Siversk would quickly become untenable if Siversk is taken by the Russians, then my guess is, just looking at maps, which I'm not a great reader of, by the way, but um, my guess is that at that point, the Russians would be in a very strong position to move on and to recapture Krasny Liman, as they would call it, Liman as the Ukrainians call it, this town that they captured back in May, which the Ukrainians captured um, in October, recaptured in October, it would, I suspect, quite quickly after the fall of Siversk, fall back under Russian control. And of course, the Russians would be in strong position 
to advance from Bakhmut itself, to Kramatorsk, and also to start interrupting communications between the Ukrainian troops in Avdivka, closer to Donetsk, and their main supply lines. The, as I understand it, Ukrainian troops in Avdivka re received most of their supplies from um, a main road that passes that uh, passes through an important Ukrainian-held town in Donetsk, in Donetsk region called Konstantinovka. If Bakhmut falls, the Russians are in a strong position, both to attack Konstantinovka itself and also to cut that road. That would interfere with Ukrainian supplies. Um, to their forces in Avdivka, and it would also weaken, it seems to me, the overall Ukrainian position um, in and around Donetsk city, which has been increasingly looking fragile as the fighting continues. So I think the fall of Bakhmut, if it does take place over the next two or three weeks, which is starting to look more likely, with all the caveats I have made, well, I think that will be very consequential indeed. It would be, if you like, the moment when we could start to talk about the beginning of the end, the end game of the battle for Donbass, which has been, to be very clear, by far the biggest battle in the Ukrainian war, this particular war. Now, I've discussed all this information. I want to make it clear that, you know, the fall of Donbass is probably not going to be the end of the war itself. And I have to say there's been a most um, extraordinary um, response to all of these events from uh, various people from the West. And my impression overall is that these... Um, this crisis, this operational crisis that Ukraine is experiencing and which has been building up now for several weeks is having a dramatic effect on Western policy. Now, I should say that it has been obvious to me for quite a long time that things have not been going well on Ukrainian battlefronts. And I think that the penny, the realisation that this was the case, finally dropped in the West with Western leaders um, a few weeks ago. And the interviews that General Zaluzhny and others gave to The Economist were a strong indicator of this. And I think also we've now had a very interesting article in Foreign Policy, uh, one of those American magazines that deals lots with foreign policy and military things, which gives an insight into the kind of reports that are probably arriving in Western capitals, in London, in Washington, obviously, in Paris, in Berlin, and of course at the NATO headquarters in Brussels. And it, it gives a very stark and rather, um, from a Western point of view, depressing picture about the state of the war. And I'm going to read extracts from it. Now, it's a long article, but I'm taking these extracts from a summary provided by a Russian telegram channel, Slavyangrad again, but let me make it very clear that this is an article from foreign policy. And as I said, I'm going to read it because as I said, it does give us an insight into um, some Western views about the state of the war itself. First of all, this is what this um, article has to say about the um, situation on the battlefronts in general 
It says the following, the partial mobilization of reservists that Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered in September has strengthened Russian forces at the front. The bombing campaign against Ukrainian in energy infrastructure is forcing Ukraine and its allies to divert resources toward the defense of the country's energy infrastructure. And elsewhere, it talks about how the Russians have built up very strong defensive positions and according to press reports and satellite imagery russian troops are digging defensive positions all along the line of contact and constructing sequential barriers of concrete obstacles and bunkers they are also presumably seeding the ground with mines and then the article deals with two other topics. One is the attack on Ukrainian energy infrastructure. And it gives a perspective to this, which is the kind that a military person would probably give, or at least somebody who has understanding of military and logistical affairs. And it's interesting, and it's not entirely the same as the one I've expressed before in my programs, but I will set out what this person says. The strikes against Ukraine's electrical grid are particularly effective and not just because they could turn the winter into a brutal struggle for survival for Ukrainian civilians. And I should, by the way, say that temperatures in Ukraine and Russia are now falling, the ground is hardening, and apparently we are now finally into the proper winter, the proper winter in these areas. But then the article goes on to say the campaign has not proved decisive so far, but like most strategic bombing campaigns, a topic which of course Americans are well informed about, it imposes direct and indirect military costs. Modern military systems for air defense, command and control, and intelligence gathering run on electricity, and if they cannot get it from the grid, they must get it from generators. But making that transition is not as easy as flipping a switch, and it can degrade these systems' performance. Moreover, relying on generators places additional demands for fuel on the Ukraine's on military logistics system. The heat signatures produced by generators, meanwhile, add yet another data point that Russian intelligence can use to produce a more accurate picture of Ukrainian forces. Russian bombing, Russia's bombing campaign also imposes opportunity costs. The Ukrainians must extend resources to adapt to the attacks, and already they have made defending electricity infrastructure from airstrikes a military and diplomatic priority. The country's substantial weapons and ammunition industry depends on electricity, as does much of the rails, rail system that moves war material around the country. With a damaged electricity grid, Ukraine's soldiers and civilians will have to rely more on diesel-powered trains and diesel generators or shift to generators powered by scarce natural gas. These exigencies will divert still more fuel that could otherwise have been used for military operations, or they will simply impose more costs on Ukraine's allies, which will need to deliver the fuel. The West is helping Ukraine to repair the grid as best it can, whilst under constant attack. But from the Russian perspective, this is good news, as the repairs consume resources that cannot be used to support fighting at the front. And then there's the most interesting paragraph of all. The most alarming thing about Russia's bombing campaign is that Moscow knows what it is doing. The Russians are hitting a small number of targets with relatively few weapons and pro producing disproportionate effects. Even though US and British officials have regularly predicted that the Russian military was, would exhaust its supply of munitions, it has ev evidently found them somewhere. Now, 
I think this is a most interesting paragraph because what it is saying, in effect, is even if this military campaign, this, this missile campaign against the energy infrastructure isn't going to result in a permanent collapse of that infrastructure, which, by the way, I still suspect is the long-term Russian plan. But even if that is not the intention, even if it continues to be operated at this current level, it is causing Ukraine and its Western backers enormous problems. And the effect on the Ukrainian war effort and on the West's support for the Ukrainian war effort is disproportionate, is far greater than the cost to the Russians of maintaining this particular missile campaign. Far from the Russians using vast numbers of missiles, as some people are saying, to conduct this campaign, far from them expending huge numbers of resources to sustain their, this campaign. They're actually <coughs> using resources on a relatively small scale, but achieving <coughs> disproportionate effects through doing them. The Ukrainians are having to find ways round the constant breakdowns in their electricity power system. The very fact that they have to turn to generators is creating a whole set of further problems. And the Western powers have been forced to embark on a frenetic hunt for, for means, both to try to keep this energy system running, despite the obvious incompatibilities, which I've discussed in previous progr uh, programs, and despite the fact that air defense, as I've often said, is not really a Western thing anyway. So I think this is an interesting take. I think eventually, I still go along with what John Helmer said, I think eventually we will see a much bigger Russian strike against the energy system. I think that the Russians are eventually moving to the point where they will be able to knock it out entirely. And I think this is probably at some point what they're going to do. And I've also said, and I think Lavrov hinted that a campaign against the Dnieper bridges and perhaps the tunnel systems that connect Ukraine to Poland, all of that might eventually be coming as well. But in the meantime, through a relatively small expenditure of resources, the Russians are able to inflict disproportionate damage on their enemy. So I thought that was an interesting paragraph in itself. But then, just to finish, the article basically demolishes the whole narrative about the Kherson offensive, the narrative that we've been hearing in the West about the Kherson offensive and the way in which this was supposedly a success. And the article says that the Russians pulled off one of the hardest military operations, retreating during a major attack without suffering the disintegration or annihilation of their forces. It was no small feat to move some 20,000 soldiers and most of the, their combat equipment across the Dnieper after Ukrainian forces had destroyed key bridges. And even while under intense intelligence surveillance by the West and Ukraine, the Russians managed to maintain the element of surprise. The Russian rearguard units maintained a coherent defence, even though they must have known that their comrades closer to the river were escaping. Somehow, the Russians managed to repair damaged bridges whilst under fire, throw up pontoon bridges and employ ferries to get their people and equipment out, defending each avenue of escape from Ukrainian attack. Now, I'm going to say that I actually think that this um, um, Russian operation was probably somewhat more straightforward than this article um, says. I think that the evacuation from Kherson, undoubtedly well executed and well planned, though it was, 
probably was not conducted under quite the extreme pressures that this article implies. I suspect that those bridges, the Antonovsky Bridge and the bridge across the Novaya Kakhovka Dam, for example, were never fully knocked out or destroyed, as this article implies. But nonetheless, the fact is that foreign policy, or rather foreign affairs, is now admitting that the uh, Russians were successful in evacuating from Kherson and that the Ukrainians did not achieve their underlying objectives there. And the article goes on to say how the mobilization has been successful. This is what um, General Zeluzhny has already said, how the Russians have um, stabilized their lines, are now heavily fortifying their lines, and are building up strategic reserves, which puts them in a position to carry out more offensives in the future. So this is all, you know, a Western take on the war. By the way, the, art, the title of the article is um, Russia, Russia's Rebound, and um, that it says that Moscow has partly recovered from its military setbacks. So you get a sense that this is what Western governments are now being told. Now, I'm going to make a number of assumptions about Western thinking about this war, but I think that they have fairly, um, fairly fact-based, and personally, I don't have any real doubts about them. I think that Plan A, the Plan A that the Western powers had right at the start, back in January, February, was that they would impose these massive sanctions on Russia. They assumed that those sanctions would have an immediate effect, that the Russian economy would collapse like a house of cards, that this would create enormous civil unrest within Russia itself, and that President Putin and his government would fall. And I think that the Western, Western leaders expected that that would happen fairly quickly. They thought that the process would probably take weeks or perhaps a few months, but that it would certainly not drag on and with no real effect, uh, success in sight. And I think that was very much the Western expectation. And it was not fulfilled. And instead, um, after the failures of the negotiations in Istanbul, which I've discussed in many programs, multiple programs, the West at that time, despite the failure of the sanctions war, was still not willing to consider negotiations or a political settlement of the crisis. Anyway, the Western powers then moved on to their plan B. And the plan B, I think, had a double, a double side. On the one hand, there were these ideas about the price gaps, the idea of trying to impose worldwide price gaps on Russia's trade in oil and, and that this would ultimately undermine the position of the Russian economy and of the Russian budget and that this would reproduce over time the effect that the sanctions that were imposed in February and March didn't produce. And that was part of Plan B. The other part of Plan B was a major reinforcement of the Ukrainian forces. They were provided with large numbers of tanks, large numbers of infantry fighting vehicles from Warsaw Pact, former Warsaw Pact invest inventories in NATO countries. They were also provided with some types of heavy equipment, Western heavy equipment, HIMARS missile launchers, uh, M777 artillery uh, pieces, Caesar self-propelled howitzers, and, of course, enormous amounts of intelligence, enormous amounts of um, data from satellites that were provided with 
help with communications, all of those sorts of things. And I think the expectation was, the plan was, that Ukraine would then launch offensives, its military offensives, sometime in August, and these offensives would regain territory from the Russians in Kharkov region and in Kherson region. It would inflict big defeats on the Russians, and this would then provoke the big political crisis in Moscow that has been the Western objective throughout this conflict. Except again, it hasn't worked out like that. Firstly, it's clear, I think it's already clear, that the oil price caps are not working. The major oil producers, OPEC Plus, are not happy with them, and have made that very clear. And the Chinese, the Indians, the Turks, um, those countries that continue to import Russian oil around the global south, the East Asian buyers, Japan, in, uh, Japan as well, they're disregarding the oil price cap. The oil price cap is not having the effect that Western leaders hoped that it might do. But perhaps more importantly still, the offensives that Ukraine launched had the opposite effect to the ones that the Western powers, the Western leaders probably expected. Yes, Ukraine did recover a certain amount of territory in Kharkov region and in Kherson region, but it failed to deliver a significant blow against the Russian military. The Russians, as we've seen from this article in Foreign Policy, were able to pull their troops out of Kherson region intact. They're able to hold the line in Kharkov region. They didn't suffer enormous losses. There wasn't a military collapse on the part of the Russians or anything like that. And on the contrary, it was Ukraine that suffered the big losses as a result of these offensives. The supplies, the tanks, the infantry fighting vehicles, the artillery, all of those, the HIMARS systems, all of those things that were supplied to Ukraine in order to facilitate this offensive, well, they burnt out. And we now have General Zaluzhny coming and giving interviews to The Economist, talking in effect about how he's running out of resources and needs more equipment. And we've had Lieutenant Colonel Vershinin also saying much the same thing and perhaps describing the condition of the Ukrainian forces in even starker terms. So what is the West doing in response to this? Well, I have repeatedly suggested that the best policy for the Western powers is to try to seek some kind of general, genuine political diplomatic settlement with the Russians. And I'm not the only person to say that. Many people have been saying that. But of course, that's not what they, the leaders in the West are prepared to do. On the contrary, we have seen a further hardening of the Western response. And I'm going to make a guess that if Bakhmut does indeed fall over the next few weeks, if um, Solidar, the Solidar um, comes under Russian control within the next few days, if the Zelensky line collapses, if Ukrainian forces are driven out of Donbass, if the Russians are able over the next few weeks, months, to push all the way to the Dnieper River, we will not see any Western rethinking of the policy. We will see rather attempts being made to try to reverse the outcome. And we've now had these big arms packages, not just from the United States, but from Germany and France, and there's hints that other countries might be joining in before long as well. So let's just go to the American um, supplies.
the United States is providing Ukraine with 50 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. It's also providing Ukraine with 18 Paladin 155 millimeter self-propelled guns, replacing, I suspect, the large numbers of M777 guns that have been destroyed and also re probably replacing some of those Caesar howitzers that France supplied, which have proved, frankly, unable to sustain themselves effectively in these tough Ukrainian conditions. But anyway, this is a big, big arms package by any measure. And the United States is also cobbling together all kinds of other weapon systems. There's supplies of Zuni rockets. These are unguided rockets launched from airplanes. Uh, they go all the way back. The Zuni rockets were developed all the way back in the 1950s. So this is quite old technology, but still effective on battlefields. And I noticed that they're now providing supply Ukraine with tow um, anti-tank missiles. Um, it looks like Javelin stocks have run out. And it also, by the way, looks like um, stocks of towed artillery have also run out because the only towed guns that have been supplied to Ukraine now are of much lighter 105 millimeter guns. So that's what the US is now doing. It's ammunition supplies to Ukraine, supplies of 155 millimeter ammunition. However, look somewhat unimpressive. I noticed that this time the United States is only supplying 500 Excalibur rounds. But anyway, we now see the United States providing Ukraine with armor. And armor, not tanks, but infantry fighting vehicles. And um, Germany has now confirmed that they're going to supply apparently 40 Marder infantry fighting vehicles. And there's now a flood of reports that there's talk now of providing Leopard 2 tanks. Probably not from German. Uh, the German military, um, but from militaries like those of Poland and Finland and all of those. And the objective seems to be to create a new Ukrainian army corps. It's apparently going to be called the 10th Army Corps. And there's also reports that Ukraine is now um, reorganizing some of its military formations and this very complex reorganization that is being conducted seems to be partly intended to reinforce and strengthen this new army corps that is being built up in the western and central regions of Ukraine. But what will that achieve? Well, I'm far from convinced in the end that it's going to achieve very much. Um, the Russians are much more heavily entrenched in their positions now than they were back in summer and early autumn. As I said, we've seen these enormous fortified lines. There's many more Russian troops there than there were in the summer and autumn. And the Russians have now built up this strategic reserve. 160,000 men. It's still in the process of being formed, but it will no doubt be active before very long. And I would have thought that these this big Russian build-up at least matches and probably, well, in fact, undoubtedly greatly exceeds the build-up that the West is now trying to put together in central and western Ukraine, based around this 10th Army Corps, which will be presumably equipped with these western infantry fighting vehicles, and presumably at some point with these Leopard 2 tanks. And what is Ukraine going to do with this Army Corps? Well, previous 
Experience suggests that they will try to take the offensive. And there's two places where they've talked about taking the offensive, and they seem to be the most likely places. One is the Kremenaya Svatovo region in northern Donbass, and the other is the Melitopol region in Zaporozhye Kherson region. And I suspect that that is where these offensives are going to take place. And that's precisely what the Russians are predicting and expecting, because that's precisely where most of these very elaborate and heavy fortifications are being built. And in the meantime, as the Russians no doubt expect the Ukrainians to break themselves against these heavy fortified lines, they're pressing on with their offensive in Donbass. And this is a different offensive from the Ukrainian offensives because the Ukrainian offensives have taken place against what has tended to be rather light Russian opposition. Um, I've already discussed at great length in many videos how there were very few Russian regular troops in Kharkov region, in the area around Izium, at the time of the Ukrainian offensive there. Um, by my estimate, there may have been around 1,000 regular troops, Russian regular troops in um, Izium. Probably not many more than that across the rest of that area of Ukraine. And in Kharkov, in Kherson region, the Russian forces numbered around 20,000. But these were large, mostly paratroopers, relatively lightly equipped again, not in any way comparable to these heavy fortified lines that we've seen built up um, in Zaporozhye and Svatovo Kremenaya. But of course, in both of those earlier offensives, the Ukrainians suffered enormous losses. And it seems to me, if the Ukrainians try and launch big offensives against these places again, they will suffer greater losses, much greater losses still. By contrast, the Russian offensive in Donbass has been conducted against intense Ukrainian resistance. The Ukrainians have fought and defended every millimeter of ground. And on the one hand, that makes that offensive slow. But it also means that once it is successful, the Russians will have achieved a decisive outcome. Unlike the ephemeral effects of the Ukrainian offensives, the Russian offensive, having regained, having gained bitterly fought ground, once it is complete, once it is successful in clearing Donbass entirely, is most unlikely to be reversed. And with apparently the greater part of the Ukrainian army resisting, committed to resisting this Russian offensive in Donbass, I can't help but think that Ukraine's losses are outrunning the speed at which it can build up its reserves in the rear. Anyway, that seems to me the overall position in the war at the moment. The Russians grinding the Ukrainians down in Donbass, pressing on with their offensive, uh, coming closer now, well, definitely, it seems, to capturing Solidar, probably very close also to capturing Bakhmut itself. Um, perhaps readying themselves for the final decisive push, which is going to break Ukrainian resistance in Donbass, perhaps aiming thereafter to push on to the east bank of the Dnieper River, opposite the important Ukrainian town of Dniepro, Dniepropetrovsk, as the Russians still call it, and the west frantically having realized that the war is not going well for Ukraine, now rushing to put together 
another arms package as Ukraine struggles to build up this reserve corps in the west central regions. Well, that's it seems to me where we are in this war at the moment. I've not considered in this program the greater possibilities of a Polish intervention. I think that remains a distinct possibility, but it seems that the current plan, plan C, if you like, is to try to build up um, these um, Ukrainian forces in West and Central Ukraine with Western military equipment. I will leave it to others, Brian Boletic, Scott Ritter, Douglas McGregor, those sort of people, to assess how quickly the Ukrainians will be able to train and absorb on this new Western equipment. And I've already expressed some views that this equipment is not well adapted to Ukrainian conditions. I'll be very interested to see what these um, worthy people have to say about this. I'm going to finish this program with a quick reference to an article in the Financial Times because it conveys for me the anger that some people in the West feel about the way in which the war is going, but also about the way in which Russia is coping with the war. And it's by Mark Seddon, who is one of the Financial Times' regular correspondents. He is, in fact, at the present time, um, the Financial Times' is, um, Moscow bureau chief. And he writes about how Moscow, a Moscow diary, fear, loathing and deep denial is the title. And he then talks about the terrible war that Russia is supposedly waging against Ukraine. To quote, missiles rain down on Kiev almost daily. Entire towns in eastern Ukraine have been razed to the ground. Villages in Russia's far-flung backwaters have lost much of their male-of-age population to the military draft. That is certainly a huge exaggeration. But then he goes to say there's one city in Putin's war doesn't seem to have changed much. It's Moscow. Instead of a wartime imperial stronghold, the city has become the capital of Putin's special operation. And um, that, you know, he makes out he's, he's very furious that life in Moscow, and by the way, in most of Russia, despite what he says, is going on pretty much as normal. And he is also clearly frustrated. I'm not going to read through the article in detail at the fact that most Muscovites, most Russians seem to be going about their normal lives in the normal way. Uh, but then he does tell us you don't have to scratch hard at the facade to see the rot setting in. The oligarchs and crooners, rather unpleasant word to describe people, but anyway, are all under Western san US sanctions. And the Michelin Guide has withdrawn all its Russian ratings. I'm sure that is a major blow to the Russians and to the restaurant trade there, that some Russian restaurants don't have Michelin ratings, but never mind. He then says a good third of the shop fronts in Moscow's malls are empty after big name Western brands pulled out. Um, that's not, by the way, consistent with what I'm hearing. It could be true in some of the luxury stores like Goom and Tsum, but I doubt that it's very much um, true. Um, it's certainly not the case that a third of shops across Moscow have closed or anything like that. But then he complains bitterly about how there aren't many people protesting. He puts it down to um, uh, fear. Um, he has somebody um, claiming that the experience of living in Moscow is like the, cla the classic remake 
1978 remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers where fear and paranoia grips the human protagonists as they struggle to work out which of their friends have been replaced by monsters. And um, then he talks about, about how um, um, some Russians, the anti-war Russians, um, are retreating back to the kitchen tables as the places where they conduct civil discourse, where they um, um, live there, uh, carried out their discussions in um, Soviet times. And anyway, it's full of, full of things like this. And he then goes on to say that shreds of the Moscow I once knew live on in the new centres of Russian exile. The anti-war journalists grumbling in Riga's dive bars, the techies in Tbilisi shy when locals mistake them for Ukrainians, the rappers raising funds for Ukrainian refugees in Istanbul. Um, and I find that a most interesting comment because um, it begs the question of whether if that is the Moscow he knew, the Moscow of anti-war journalists, uh, techies and rappers, <laughs> that it's a Moscow that isn't very representative of the Moscow than, that I know. It suggests that Mark Seddon has been spending a disproportionate amount of his time with a relatively small um, number of people. But anyway, that's, that's the overall view. It's one of deep anger, bitter anger, at the way, the extent to which um, life in Russia seems to be continuing as normal, that there hasn't been either the economic collapse or the mass protest movement that perhaps some journalists in the West accepted and the deep anger that people like Mark said and feel that anti-war sentiments seem to be confined and expressed now by very few. Well, I've been saying for many years that Western journalists spend most of their time when they go to Moscow, not just in Moscow, ignoring the rest of the country, but talking to a very unrepresentative section of the, cap of the Russian capital's population. I'm sorry to say Mark Seddon's article confirms that. And I'm also going to say this, that I think that this article has something about it of the signs of the scales falling from the eyes of finally seeing that Russians, most Russians, do not share the perspective of things that people like Mark Seddon have. Anyway, I mentioned this article, I thought it was an interesting article. I'm, as I said, surprised perhaps a little at the anger with which it is written, but there it is. We will see what happens over the course of the next few days. Clearly the focus now is very much on what's going on in Solidar and perhaps in Bakhmut as well. And obviously, if there's any big military developments over the next couple of days, I will be discussing it in my future programs. Well, thank you for joining me again today. Please uh, remember that all our videos are posted on multiple platforms, including locals, where our, we have our main community, Rumble, um, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, and Telegram. Um, you can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. Don't forget to go to our shop and buy yourself the great things that you will find there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those amazing things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to take the like button, 
and to check your subscription to the channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.